So Allie Urain is joining us today. She has a company called Kickstart. She's going to talk to us about leadership, which of course all of you are. All of us in that capacity can can certainly learn more and gain insights. Um, she's coming to us, as she said, from Australia. So it's the middle of the night and the weekend. So we are are very happy that you you are joining us. Anyway, I will let you do further introduction to yourself because you will do it much better than I will. So we hand it over to you. She will facilitate questions at the end, um, but certainly put your questions in chat as you have them and we'll monitor that. Thank you, Allie. Thank you so much. Now, typical with sometimes with the uh... We might have to just bear with me here. It did work before, and I've now got a little issue with the sharing. So if you can just bear with me for one moment, I'm oh. going to just go back in. We were able to see it. You were able to see yes. it. So bear yeah, with me. Can you see it now? Yes, just not presentation. You can see it. Yes. Yeah, okay. So just bear with me. Let's see how we go. It's always the way, isn't it? Okay, can you see this now? Yes. Okay, so... Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, Tina and I first discussed this back in January of this year um, about doing something a little, a different take on leadership. And um, this won't be a traditional um, sort of approach to leadership. We're going to talk about high value leadership in particular today and, and what makes that. And I'm going to come from a particularly different background with a, a stronger sort of L&D focus around it. That's my background. Um, Thank you for the kind introduction, Cindy. Uh, I created Kickstart in 2008, so I've been in my space for quite some time. Before I got here, I worked in advertising and marketing, then moved into entrepreneurship, L&D. Uh, in that time, I've developed over 2,000 people, lots of leadership and other roles, and worked with over 2,000 uh, value purpose-led brands, including universities, Coca-Cola. I did the whole of um, the workforce transformation uh, in South Australia when they closed their factory. And that was a big project. So I work right across Australia at the moment. I'm keen to, to move beyond. Um, I feel that we are very much in changing times. And I, I think that certainly leadership is not what it was and it won't be what it is, you know, even in a year you know, year's time, we're going to see a lot of difference around that as well too. So today, when we're talking about high value leadership, we're looking at what is it? How do I define it? Uh, what talents and traits make it up and how do you even know that you've got it so how do you know whether or not you've got it in your own practice and one thing that I would say and it's certainly I feel being one of the reasons for the success of the work that I've done is that I do come from a very holistic background um, I don't look at things in isolation so you'll see that today when we start to unpack what this is you'll see all the little parts will start to join together um, so for example if I'm talking about learning and development uh, and a project, I'll also be talking about how the roles actually exist and how we need to design them. So lots of things are brought together uh, in high value leadership. So we've got a lot to get through. I don't um, know how long this part will run for, but I'm certainly going to allow time for us to have conversation and discussion at the end as well too. So take notes. Uh, there won't be any slides available after as such, but uh, there'll be some gold that will fall out. So uh, let's let's get going. So think about what high value leadership means to you. Like when you hear that, what are some of the, the qualities and some of the traits that tend to come to mind for you? And for me, when I think about it, it actually means three things. It means being across the changes in how people in your team live and think and work. And I think it's fair to say, especially since COVID, but even before we were starting to see a change in what people value and how they want to live and how they want to work. And I know that while we're in different countries, there are similarities between Australia um, and the US and people are now wanting something different from the experience that they get in the workplace as well too, right? So high value leadership is being able to understand what people want and being able to understand that and get the truth from people too sometimes too around how they're experiencing their workplace. So that's the first one. The second point when I think about high value leadership is that they are not generic in their approach. So they're able to craft personalised learning and development experiences for their people. And that means that everyone is treated equal and everyone is treated uh, with a level of 
um, consideration around those, those individual nuances. Uh, at the moment, and I think the US would be the same, we've got four different generations in the workplace now in Australia. That's the first time. That's the first time. And I think the US is the same. They do include the traditionalists in that, but they are people that are my parents' age, God love them, and they'd be over 80. So I would say there's four generations at the moment that we have in the workforce, and we've never had that before. So high value leadership is about bringing together all those different uh, needs and wants and expectations and experiences too, right? So there's a real, that's a, that's a real sophistication, I think, in being able to do that. And I think that's a challenge moving forward, but I think it's also a great opportunity. And then high value leadership is keeping, it's like spinning plates almost, isn't it, right? Like it's almost about, you know, you're keeping the internal team happy and your, your team and people happy, but then you've got the commercial needs of the business, which you can't obviously forget that need to be top of mind. And then you've got client and stakeholder needs also that need to be able to be balanced as well too. So high value leadership is many things, but I'd like to categorise it under those three key areas as well too when I think about it. I think the next thing I'm going to say um, can be controversial and it's not designed to be, but it's just something that I have experienced in the last 18 years. It's been a real point of difference in my work. High value leadership is no longer about strength. So we've been taught, and I'm just going to, this might be an interesting discussion at the end if, you, you know, if you'd like to have it, you'll, you'll take us where we need to go on that. But we've been taught from a very early age to always focus on strengths, haven't we? Yeah, that you focus on your strengths and, you know, you'll be right and it's all strength-based. And strengths are important, but your strengths are not going to solve every problem and challenge that you face in business. So I have done a lot of work successfully thinking about threats and gaps, knowledge gaps, skill gaps in a different way. And so high value leadership for me is not just about focusing on strengths, but identifying and opening up space to talk about those gaps, those threats and those risks. And I do use the tennis player analogy here when I explain this. So sometimes it will challenge the premise around, you know, focusing always on strengths. And I always say, hey, hang on. Let's say, for example, that you're a tennis player, right? You've got a really strong forehand, but a weak backhand. What do you reckon the coach is going to do? They're not going to say, hey, yeah, don't worry. The opposition will keep hitting to your backhand. No, they're not, right? <laughs> they're going to expose the weakness, right? And where the gap is. So there is no, you'll never exponentially grow by continuing to focus on what you're good at. And it's important that you nurture it, that you keep working on that craft, but that you're looking in the areas where, um, you know, there is that opportunity for growth. So high value leadership absolutely creates the space to talk about, what isn't working as well? So where are the gaps? That's number one. Number two, addressing those challenges and roadblocks. Um, I know, and because of my background, I've done a lot of work in traumatised organisations. Um, some I knew that I was going into that were like that, and some were um, discovered, unfortunately, after the fact. But when we can create spaces for respectful truth-telling, and I believe that is the role of leadership to help curate that, then we start to see healthier workplaces. Um, we need to think about at the moment why we're having the concerns at times that we are having within organisations and we're not making space to talk about challenges and roadblocks and, and bringing the team in there to be able to co-create it as well too. And the third point is actually workplace threats and risk to people's wellbeing. So I see that high value leadership, it is changing in its nature and we get a really good feel for that as we move through this, but it is developing that whole person it's not just strengths. You will hit a peak when you're only focusing on strengths and then you'll be incredibly vulnerable. We can talk about that as well. But I want to, you know, I think high value leaders actually make people not fearful of those gaps and threats. High value leaders are allowing people to go into places where they didn't think they could go uh, and developing people. And I'll, I'll talk about the, the learning and development hats that I feel high value leaders do wear and will need to wear moving forward as well too. So we're going to go there. But yeah, high value leadership is certainly not just focused on the team strength as well too. So earlier on in the week, and Tina, I might send this to you later on over the weekend or on Monday, I, I did an interview um, for Transform. I don't know if you're aware of Transform, but Transform is a community that comes out of the US, do a really big um, conference every year in uh, Las Vegas, well, they've created an international chapter. 
and they have global ambassadors. And I put my hand up to be an ambassador here and set a chapter up in Tasmania where I am. Um, not Tanzania, but Tasmania. <laughs> Sometimes it can get confused. And we spoke this week and the interview will come live in about a month around what the, the trends and the themes are that we're seeing in work and what's happening at work and what does that mean, both from a local, national and global level. And there's some interesting themes there that I wanted to share with you this morning because I believe they are relevant to what high value leadership is and, and that learning and development piece, which I'll talk about a lot because I do feel that is where uh, the future is going to be shaped. Um, and so I want to take you through some of those if I can, and then I can share the post that I did earlier on the week if you're interested in that as well too. So we have to talk about high value leadership and context around what's happening in the environment. And I can talk about what I'm certainly seeing and what I've researched and the reports and the conversations that I'm having. And that will start to, and hopefully you'll start to uh, identify some of those even in your own workplaces as well. But these are some of the things that we're seeing that we're going to need to be able to be prepared for in our own approach as well. And the first one is, and you might see this, so just put it up there if, you, if you're recognising this. We're seeing a growing expectation from leaders and probably on leaders from even higher up, but leaders onto managers and managers onto teams to learn quicker, yeah, to do more, to learn more to gain skills and knowledge and learn it quickly and put it into practice and leverage it as well and apply it so much faster before. And so the outcome of that, and that's all well and good, but the outcome of that is that we're putting increased stress and pressure on people to be able to do that. And a lot of the time what I am seeing is that we're not always putting the support conditions and that capability piece around it to help people to deliver on that. And that is a major concern. So high value leaders set fair and reasonable expectations that are inspirational, but they understand and are very, very clear around what the capacity and the capability is of the people at the time. And I can't stress that enough because a lot of the work that I'll do early on, we go in, we're having the conversations with leadership. They're talking about, hey, I, I put blah, blah through training. They went and did this course. They went and did that certificate. Um, I would have thought they were doing X by now. And there's always one simple question that I ask that resets the room. And that is, well, what resources and support and conditions have you provided to make that happen? And it seems so simple, but it silences the room and it makes people reflect on what is actually being provided as well too. So high value leaders get real about the reality that their team's working in. And I'm going to come back to that in a bit more detail in a minute. So the first point I made was that we are expecting people to learn quicker, right? So, you know, you, you'll read that efficiency is where it's going to be won and you've got to be able to, you know, if you don't get to market first then you're not going to win and someone's going to get there before you. So if we want people to learn and apply that knowledge quicker, what do you think is going to happen? People are going to make mistakes more, right? They're going to, that's just a natural part of it as well too. So what we need to be able to do to as high value leaders is to create the space where it's okay to make mistakes, but more importantly, we can actually learn from them. Because I wrote a post the other week, I write quite a lot on LinkedIn and Tina will tell you that I'm a prolific content writer and you know um, got awarded top voices this year, which I'm proud of because it shows that there's, you know, that, that there is a need to have a different conversation on that platform. Um, but for me, it really is about we have to not only be able to get comfortable that we will make mistakes, but that we're actually able to convert it into something useful. Because I don't know, and I'd be interested in your opinion at the end too, share it. Do we learn from mistakes? Not always. There's a process behind that, right? And that's what I wrote about a couple of weeks ago saying, I don't know whether or not we actually learn from mistakes. Um, and particularly in the workplace, there is a process which I've um, packed in there around actually breaking down mistakes and turning it into something useful, not just at an individual level, but at a team and organisational level as well too. So I think we need to be, and this is a term that I've coined recently relating to high value leadership, we need to be responsibly efficient. <laughs> I think, you know, we, we've asked people, and you may have even done it yourself sometimes, for quick wins. 
there can't be quick wins. Quick wins can sometimes be irresponsible. So high value leaders are asking their people to deliver, but in a way that is responsibly efficient as well too. So as I said, make sure that yes, you're asking your people to be able to deliver efficiently and be able to take that knowledge. And absolutely, I think there's so much waste in learning and development because there isn't the framework or the approach to take it and convert it and play with it and experiment with it in real time. So absolutely, but yeah, we need to make sure that we're being real about the conditions and environments that we're putting around that. Um, one of the next things that I see out in the field that is relevant to what high value leadership is, is being respectfully curious. And high value leaders are able to ask the questions that get people to be honest about what's going on in the workplace too, right? How often will leaders say, I didn't even know that was happening? Why didn't they tell me? That's been going on for months. Why didn't I know? And so high value leadership is about being able to ask the questions that get people to actually think differently. I've had people that have come to me and I've worked with, like I said, everything from people from general managers to CEOs to leaders to frontline staff to lecturers to the whole gamut. You know, when you work 18 years, you see a lot of different people and work with them quite intimately, not just for half an hour, but for many, many months, you know, at a time every week. So you do get to understand about, I suppose, the human condition and hopes and dreams and so forth. But high value leaders are really aware of their expectations that sit on that side and then the um, workplace reality of their team and then the gap that sits in the middle there as well too. And I, that's what I have found a lot is the leadership fantasy and the, the actual uh, team reality. So high value leadership is about identifying where the gap is between the two and then being able to work together to be able to uh, fulfill those gaps. And, and just to the point before, one comment that was made a number of years ago, but it's always stuck with me. Someone said to me in one of the sessions that I was doing, one-on-one, -on -one, until I came here and worked with you, I never had to think. And that really stuck with me, right? Now, I've worked with, literally I have over 2000 people, right? A lot for ongoing and, really quite involved and that really stuck with me and then I started to think that we don't create environments traditionally where we're asking for people's opinion when we're asking for them to bring their ideas and to maybe challenge what we're doing and to push back respectfully on that so high value leaders create those continuous learning environments and for me that's particularly important I think we talk a lot about continuous learning and I think high value leadership is going to be a key role in that as well too. So that's the first, that's the point I want to make about that. And then that means if we're going to make continuous learning part of our workplace, that means it's across every role and team and function, which means then we need to be able to create the processes and the systems and the conditions. We talk about continuous learning, but just saying it doesn't actually make it so. So I think we're going to see a change through high value leaders where we'll start to understand the impact of learning and development more. I, I still think in certain sectors of business that learning and development is seen simply as training at times and is not particularly understood. And maybe that's the prop, the fault, not the fault, but the, the issue with the L&D team or the HR team that we're not selling it well either. So I think there's a few um, areas there that need to be worked on. But I don't believe, and I hope not, because when you design L&D and it's done right, it is a game changer. It really is. So I'm hoping that we will stop seeing through high value leaders that understand L&D, that it's not something that you just bolt on to an activity. It's not just something that you send people off to and you don't understand what they're doing or what they've done and, and what the value is of that, but that it's actually embedded into projects every single day. And I think that we'll start to see that L&D and continuous learning through experimentation and so forth will become part of everyone's workplace um, rather than some sort of piecemeal thing that you do when there's a little bit of leftover budget. So that is my hope. I think that's where we're gonna have to, to go. I think certainly with AI, and um, we're not gonna have that discussion at one o'clock in the morning, but <laughs> I think when we talk about AI, and we think about how 
that's going to change the way that we interact with one another and how we have to learn. Uh, I, I do feel that what we're talking about here this morning is critical um, to not only people's skills, but their well-being and their ability to transition into a, a different reality as well too. The next point that I want to make around high belly leadership is that its skill set is changing and it's been changing for quite some time and not just at leadership level, but across the whole team. So I started just to give you some context in 2008, starting, I saw a gap and the gap is still there. Um, it hasn't been filled as such, but a gap in entrepreneurial thinking to be able to solve everyday work problems. And that is where my space is and that's where it remains. And obviously it's involved over time, but that is where we're going to start to see it. We talk about empathy and empathy is a trait that we need, but I'm talking about an actual way of thinking. And so what I see with high value leadership, we're going to start to see critical thinking, creative thinking, entrepreneurial thinking. Um, obviously, problem solving has always been in leadership, of course, too. But thinking more like an actual brand and how entrepreneurs take themselves to market and how they respond to challenge, I think that's going to be incredibly important in high value leadership. And I think it's going to be important for the leaders to be able to have that and understand it, to be able to give that to their people. Because I do see that that is going to be a set of skills uh, and knowledge set that won't be just for leadership and management. It's actually going to be across every single role. Um, and I think if we talk about changes in technology, and particularly with AI, um, AI is going to tell us, I said I was going to talk about AI, now I'm talking about AI, but that's okay. <laughs> um, if we talk about and think about AI, AI will give us data and it will give us um, some way or framework to move forward, but we're still going to have to make sense of it. We're going to have to understand what that means for us and how we're going to interpret that and what the challenges could be around that. So, you know, I, I think AI um, really will move this forward um, because if not, we're going to be layering another level of complexity on top of um, a missing capability set, I feel, as well too. So, yeah, as I said, I think we're going to see a more equitable approach to LND through these leaders that are perhaps being um, understanding that they won't be able to do that all and that they won't have all the answers. And that's going to be incredibly important as well. Um, so LND sits at the core, if you haven't got the, the vibe already, LND sits at the core of what high value leadership is. And there's three areas um, that I like to talk about around this and feel that every leader that has a team will need to get skilled up on. And the first one is being a trainer, being a generous sharer of knowledge and skills and experiences, and maybe training sort of more so in a, in a, in a formal setting with their team, rather than just maybe an informal team meeting where you just make a comment or you're giving a little bit of advice. I see that uh, the leaders, the high value leaders of the future are actually going to be taking their knowledge and experiences, including the ones that are not always great, and putting that into more of a sort of formalised approach as, as well too. So trainer is one of the first tools that I see that the high value leader would need to have. Mentor, we know about mentoring. Um, that will be where it's going to be one-on-one, -on -one, where it will be a sounding board. It will be personalised guidance and, and allowing people to actually find their own way through. Um, and I see that these roles are part of a more personalised ongoing learning and development plan as well too for each person. But the mentoring part is being that sounding board as well, not, not determining that future, but allowing people to have a space where they can come and think and be safe um, in that discussion as well too. And then the final hat that I see high value leaders will need to be wearing will be that they will be the facilitator of new ideas from their team and will play an important part of working in partnership um, with their team to take those ideas and test them and experiment and play with them and pull them apart as well too. So trainer, mentor, facilitator, they're, uh, I think, a particularly important skill set that if leaders don't have them, they're going to need to have them. And I think if they did have these skill sets and resources, I think that we would start to see a different type of connection as well too uh, within our workplaces than what we currently have at the moment in some cases. So high value leaders have a couple of different responsibilities I see moving forward when it comes to development. That's the reskilling 
of their um, current workforce and particularly AI is getting the attention around that. But there's going to be other things at the moment that are going to be happening that people are going to need to be reskilling their workforce on. Um, one thing I will say in terms of succession planning, um, that's a whole other topic, of course, but you can't have a succession plan if you don't have strong learning and development foundations to work from. So that is why this this angle and talking about high value leadership with an L&D focus over the top of it is critical. Um, so yeah, succession planning can only come once we have uh, this um, very much embedded. But the reskilling of the workforce is gonna be a particularly important role moving forward, uh, upskilling. So as we know, nothing, nothing stays the same. We're here, I'm here in the middle of the night, you're here in the morning. Um, we need to keep moving forward and we need to keep learning. We need to keep unlearning. That's that's something that we're starting to see much more talk around, but we do. We, we know that, as I said, the skill set that we have now will need to be uh, reviewed and pulled apart and added to and removed and, and so forth. So upskilling um, ongoing in a way that has a plan behind it is going to be particularly key um, in high value leadership and continuous learning, which we talked about. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment around agile learning and what that means and what are some of the components around that? How do you know that, yeah, you know, and agile is used in lots of things, but if you've got an agile learning environment, how do you know you've got it? So I'm going to take you through that in a minute as well too. So one of the most important things that I feel from the work that I have done that has made the difference that is sometimes missing from our workplaces is that ability to experiment and play with knowledge and with skills and test ourselves and see what we're capable of. And so High Valley Leadership actually does that and it does it very well and High Valley Leaders make space and time for that. And self-reflection, right, that's critical. Um, we don't do enough self-reflection. I don't, I don't think I'm talking out of school when I say that, yeah? It's, it's absolutely a game changer. And I'm gonna give you some questions. They're not up here. Um, uh, no, actually, I think I added them at the last minute. Sorry, middle of the night, bear with me. Um, I'm going to give you some questions that are going to help you uh, to self-reflect and to use it with your team if you have teams. They're going to be very helpful and take people in a different place, but we'll go there in a minute. So we want to create agile environments where people can learn, pull apart what they know, play with it, um, shape it and evolve it. So learning agility actually has nine traits, but I've pulled out because of timing, five key traits of what it means to have an agile learning environment. And I've pulled these out because I feel that they are most representative of what, how we've defined high value leadership and also to um, that learning and development mindset. So I'm just gonna take you through these and give you some examples. You might wanna write these down around how to identify these aspects in your own team um, as a high value leader. So flexibility. So that means some of these will be quite obvious, but we'll go through them. Um, flexibility, showing adaptability to new situations, proposing novel ideas, and remaining open to doing new things. Now that's not easy for humans sometimes, is it? <laughs> doing new things and being open to new ideas. So flexibility. I wrote a post two days ago about whether or not future proofing is BS. And I asked the community to give me their feedback. And so they did. <laughs> and I didn't come with any, no, 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 I've got a very smart, curated, you know, generous community, but it's to start to open up a discussion around that and whether or not we can future proof it. And it was interesting what came out through that, but a lot of it was saying, hey, there isn't any guarantee as such, but we need to be adaptable and we need to be open to new ways of doing, and we need to be responsive. So I thought that was interesting. So flexibility, uh, not, not being absolutely set, knowing when to turn direction as well. So which that probably links into the next point here around speed. So that's important. We need to be able to know as leaders when it is not going to work, when we know that it is dead in the water, when it's worthwhile pursuing. So being able to actually get and start to trial and test that knowledge efficiently, responsibly, efficiently is critical as well too. And acting on those new ideas, but moving on from failure and being able to actually take our team along with us and to change the way in which we see 
I don't like the F word at all. Like, yeah, for me, I'll never really use it. I, I, I do truly believe that you'll either win or you'll learn from it. And if we can learn from it, um, then it's much easier to, to work with and move forward from. But speed is particularly important in being able to not be stuck in what didn't work, but to be able to truly learn from those mistakes that we talked about before. One of my favourite things ever, experimenting. Um, critical to be able to actually have an agile learning environment. You're not going to know. The sooner you start playing with it, the sooner you'll know whether or not it's actually going to be beneficial or if you need to move on from it. So experimenting is important. And the leader, as I said, leaders lead, you go first. And for me, it is about being able to share and trial and show that it's okay to do something. And while a lot of it will work, not all of it will. So experimenting is showing eagerness for doing something that you haven't done before. And that is absolutely going to be critical. How many organisations talk about innovation, but their work practices and organisation isn't designed to do any of this, right? So you can't have innovation if you're not prepared to go through the trip as well too. Um, interpersonal risk taking. This is an interesting one because this, this requires you to be uh, vulnerable in parts too. But that means learning and creating spaces to deliberately learn from one another. And I'm going to give you some good questions around that as we move towards the end. But that means learning from each other, sharing what hasn't worked, admitting those mistakes and overcoming those difficulties together. And I feel that interpersonal risk taking when done well changes and rewires relationships. It does. It, it, it makes people trust one another um, as long as you're clear with your motive and your intent, but it does rewire relationships and how people choose to show up. And uh, for me, I, I've always been a big believer where appropriate that I will share certain aspects of um, not just my business life, but personal where it adds value and it's appropriate. And it does, it makes a connection, but uh, you have to be willing to, to share some of your own story around that as well too, um, you know, in context as well. And the final aspect of agile learning that I really wanted to highlight this morning, and these are for you also to, to self-reflect on as we work together today to think about how many you can identify in yourself as well and where are the gaps or the opportunity to grow more. But reflecting uh, is critical and high value leaders don't need to keep layering projects on top of projects without having that space, more space for light, I say, and that is actually having the opportunity to have space to uh, slow down, you know, slow down to speed up, but to, to actually slow down and reflect on, uh, you know, what has worked, what hasn't, what needs to be removed, what do we need to redesign, what needs to be introduced, uh, that, that, that overall performance um, piece, but also the mistake piece as well too, so that we're able to adjust but yeah, there's nine aspects of agile learning um, that you will find, but I really, because of timing, wanted to focus on the top five that I feel are most important. If I had to put them into my uh, work performance uh, as a high value leader, this is where I'd be focusing. And this is when I reflect on my own practice over the 18 years, what, what elements of those continuous learning projects have had the most outcomes and impact, and it's these, these areas as well. So I wanted to share those with you this morning as well so that you can start to do some self-reflection. So we've gone through quite a bit today. We're at 20 to, well, I'm looking at my watch, 20 to two. <laughs> How are we all going okay? Yeah, um, we're doing fine. What I thought we would do is I'm just gonna spend, there's a couple of activities. So we've unpacked a lot of knowledge. We've talked about high value leadership and how to actually start to identify it. But there's three actions that I wanted to give you after today. And Tina, if it's you know easier for me to, to send this to you in an email, I can do that because there's quite a bit of information in this. But um, there's three actions that I thought would be worthwhile. I always like to do actions and live by what I, what I preach around the reflection piece. So how do you know? You won't know where you sit with this until you understand where you currently are. So I've got three actions that I'd like to get you to, to do after today and see where you fall. And if you want to share them um, with me later, then I'd, I'd love to know. But the first action that I would do after today, based on your knowledge and some of the thoughts and ideas that you've had, is to undertake a leadership stock take. So go back through some of your notes and the discussion that we've had and think about how many you can identify within your own work practice at the moment based on workplace, real evidence, real examples, right, about where you're living, um, experimenting with your team or interpersonal risk-taking or reflecting or that learning and development piece around 
personalizing the development of your team or any any of those elements think about where are you doing well choose two or three areas where you feel that you've got that evidence to back that up and where are two or three areas where you feel that there are gaps there that if you were to do something different and to spend some time thinking about it that you would start to see a change in outcome and impact. Um, when I'm in my work um, out in the field, I don't just measure outcome. I think this is important just to mention this. Impact is incredibly important. Outcomes we know about, right? They're your KPIs, they're the things that are easy to manage there. You either achieve it or you don't. But the impact is the behaviours, the actions, the language, the words, how people show up. Um, this one might sound weird, but I've seen it. It's even how they look. Um, it's how they dress. Um, impacts are incredibly important. We need to also be aiming for impact because that change in behaviour and language and words and thought um, does sustain uh, this, these outcomes long term as well too. So think about, you know, where are the areas that you could do different around that that would move the dial the most for you? So that's my first action that I've got for you there. The second one is to review your team meeting approach. Do most people have teams here? Might have teams, have teams, will have teams again. Um, if you do have teams, I just want to talk about this as well too, um, for you to go back and think about, hey, am I living that sort of high leadership, high value leadership mindset and attitude and how I show up? So for example, the team meeting can be a great litmus test for this. Um, do you use those meetings as idea sessions where people are coming and doing things different or is it that tending to be that rinse and repeat where you're on Groundhog Day again? Um, I'm going to give you a couple of questions. These aren't in the slide deck, but I wanted to share them with you because they're things that I have used in terms of questioning in meetings that have started to open up different conversations, started to get people to, to be more engaged and more connected and, and change the relationships and for me, I referred to it again, it's about being respectfully curious. High value leaders are respectfully curious. And I've always loved, well, I love most people, <laughs> but I love asking questions and I love finding out about people. And I think high value leaders do that. So these are real questions that I've asked out in the field in teams to actually start to move from being more of a disconnected same old approach to now starting to hang on, things are changing around here and I need to get involved and start to step up. And these are the questions I ask the team. Okay, some of these you'll, you'll know and some will be a little bit different. So the first question is, what's worked well this week and why? That's a good one. So they can talk about what's worked well, why do you think it has, right? So I'm not just asking them what worked well, I want you to think at another level around why. What are you most excited about? And I think that's important, right? Like sometimes we get caught in the day-to-day but we need to have something to look forward to. And I always ask them, what are you excited? What's coming up in your, in your schedule or up in your, in your projects that you're excited about? I ask them what hasn't gone to plan and why do you think that is? So again, um, before we get to this point, it's important to say that they are very, very um, clear on what my intent and motive is of running the meeting in this way, right? So there's no surprises. There's no hidden agendas. They understand exactly why we're doing this and what we're hoping to achieve from it as well. But why hasn't it gone to plan and why do you think that is? The next question is incredibly important because it starts to change the mind from, geez, I'm no good, that didn't work, I'm terrible, I'm going to get fired, to hang on, there's actually something positive in this that we can use. And that is, what are the lessons learned from this experience, right? So get them time to actually think about it and reflect on it. And if people are struggling to answer these, I don't give them a get out of jail free card. I'll say, you know what, if you're struggling with it, how about have a think and let's come back tomorrow and, and catch up on it, yeah? Because like I said, I need we need to be building people's capability to not just reflect, but to think and then do something with that. So I'm always asking them to think about where are the lessons learned from that? And then what would you do different knowing what you know now? What would be different in your work in how you actually would operate now that you know that? So now they're taking something from it. Now they can start to learn from, from said mistake rather than just move on to the next project. And then the final one is, is an important one because it's about generosity. And I feel that one of the most important values that we can have as leaders is to be generous in how we show up, generous in our knowledge and generous in our character. And this is the final question that I ask teams, and that is, what can the team and even broader organisation learn from your experience? What do we need to know now that can make the difference? So the people aren't just sitting on 
their experience. They're now sitting on it, reflecting on it, pulling it apart, doing something useful and putting it out and sharing it with others as well too. So go back against some of those questions and, and look at whether or not you're doing the same old meeting process where you're literally just going through and everyone's um, justifying you know, what they're doing or whether or not you're starting to take them into a place of learning and development um, and they're, they're really idea sessions. And then the final action that I think would be great for you to do if you're up for it, and if you do it at the moment, is to review your existing employee review experience at the moment. What does that look like? And I know, um, again, I wrote about this recently, that they don't have to be trauma-inducing experiences for people, but they often are. But we can change them. And I believe it's the role of high value leaders working with HR and all the other relevant parties to develop experiences that are actually good for people's development. That's what they should be there for and good to help the business grow as well too. So there's four key elements that I've designed that I embed into any learning and development um, slash review that I've designed with clients. And there's four elements. And I want to take this, um, take you through this as our final part before we open up for Q&A. And the first element that I always make sure that I've got um, in an employee review is to make sure that it has uh, an element of learning and development. So it leads to a personalised learning and development plan. If you're doing a review and there's no tangible personalised plan that comes out of that, then for me personally, I think you would be um, wasting time. The second element is that the review opens up discussion around ideas, opportunities and challenges that the organisation can take and actually innovate from. So it's more of a high level discussion. It's not just, oh, how are you going in the role? What did you rate yourself? Oh, you gave yourself eight. I gave you seven. No, no, no. These are, these are discussions where we're reviewing that role and what that role means and where it sits and what we can be doing. And like I said, just a high value overview around not just the individual, but the relationship with the person and the organisation on a higher level as well too. So that third element I alluded to, reviews are also a great opportunity to sit down and think about how relevant that role is to what the person needs to be doing. We don't look at roles soon and uh, often enough, really. In my experiences, they normally tend to be set and forget. So within the review, we should also be looking at the role. Does that role still remain relevant? Does it still achieve the same out, um, outcomes and impacts? Is it still moving where we're going as an organisation or as a department? And allow people, one thing that I really see that is critical is allow your people to work with you in helping scope that up. High value leaders find all these deliberate smart opportunities to get ownership and buy-in from their people. So employee reviews, element three, are you using it as an opportunity to sit down with your person and have a critical look at what that role is and how relevant it now is to as well too? And that's element four. Pardon me. Be hands-on, pull it apart, use it as a way to do multiple things, not just one thing, but use it to create a learning and development plan Review where the organisation is going. Look at the role. Think about how you can work differently together. Do a stock take on waste too. I mean, I'm going to write soon about role waste and how we can start to identify that um, within our discussions as leaders to team. So as I said, I think the employee review um, is a real, the way in which we design that is a reflection of who we are as leaders as well too. So there's three actions there that I believe are going to help you start to see how well you're doing in that space and how you want to evolve from that as well too. And like I said, not to celebrate what's working well, but where are the gaps and the, um, the opportunities to uh, fulfil those as well. So I have got those in my session notes, Tina. If you want me to send it to you uh, in an email, I can do that to send out to people because they are very, very worthwhile. And as I said, only when you go back and start to look through your, your own work and start to reflect on your own practice do you, you start to see where you're actually launching from as well too. So... That's the questions that I worked through with you. What's worked well? What hasn't gone to plan? Lessons learned? What would you do different now? And what can the team learn from you moving forward? So as I said, taking it away from I'm no good to hang on, I can actually do well from this too, changes the game. So we are, where are we now? I think we're 10, well, I finished right on time, which is quite amazing really, because I didn't time myself. So there you go. I just thought, I think we're going to fall around about that and then have 10 minutes if you would like it for questions. A um, couple of things here 
just so that you know where to find some extra original content um, and IP to, to access if you're interested in the topic in a little bit more detail is you can visit, um, well, that's my email, that's my website. There's a lot of complimentary blogs and video and podcasts that won't make it onto LinkedIn. There's a lot of it. So if you'd like to explore, do. And if you want to connect in um, to me on LinkedIn, then that is where you'll find me. And as I said, I do uh, write Monday to Fridays and original content around learning and development, org development, topical things, the not so obvious discussions uh, in that space. So if you're up to, to be part of the community, uh, we'd love to have you. So